Hey, 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 you know what time it is? Woo! Get into it! Yes! Yes! Woo! We are back. Oh, goodness, y'all. My apologies. Had a notification. We are here. And no, I don't own the music that is being played in the background, which is classical music made by a black composer of classical music. His name is Joseph... <laughs> I'm going to try not to butcher this name. Joseph Boulangerie Chevalier de Saint-Georges. Very French, very beautiful, melanated man who made classical music. A lot of times in history, people get mulled over and not get the spotlight they deserve. But on this particular network, on this particular platform, we get into it. And thank you, Aaron. I appreciate you, my friend. Much love to you. Need to come up here to Yellow Springs to visit. Seriously. I know, right? It is a name. I'm reading comments, y'all, as I'm doing this for those who are watching this on YouTube later on. Uh, but we're back with Anne of Green Gables. We are on Chapter 14, and my tea is about to get ready. So, be right back, y'all. day in Ohio and it's supposed to storm all week but it's still gonna be 91 85 degrees varying like throughout the week which is so odd to me but humidity is real hence why it's gonna be hot but that's in the words words of Shirley I'm gonna be in here with the coolant I'm gonna be in here with the coolant mm-hmm uh-uh that's gonna you gonna be outside oh baby that's a no for me Mm-mm, that's a no for me. As for me and my house, we will be inside with the coolant. Because it's hot. It's hot, y'all. Like, if I was by water, I would never complain. But I'm in Ohio, in a beautifully forested area in Yellow Springs, where my apartment building is. It's, it's beautiful. It's hot. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> oh, gosh. I hope everybody's having a lovely day. I had an awesome day at work, to say the least. Shout out to my amazing co-workers at Ellie's Restaurant and Bakery. Oh my goodness, I'm gonna have to... My apologies, y'all. I have to get a new eyeglass wiper or some spray. Some lens cleaner. There we go. I was trying to look for the term. Okay. Ooh, let me have a drink of water before I start. Shout out to my buddy Archimedes, joining us on our little adventure, Reedy. Chapter 14, Anne's Confession. Uh-oh. On the Monday evening before the picnic, Marilla came down from her room with a troubled face. And, she said to that small personage who was shelling peas by the spotless table and singing Nellie of the Hazel Dell, with a vigor and expression that did credit to Diana's teaching. Did you see anything of my amethyst brooch? I thought I stuck it in my pincushion when I came home from church yesterday evening, but I can't find it anywhere. I... Excuse me. I saw it this afternoon when you were away at the AIDS Society, said Anne, a little slowly. I was passing your door when I saw it on the cushion, so I went in to look at it. Did you touch it? said Marilla sternly. Yes, admitted Anne. I took it up and I pinned it on my breast just to see how it would look on her dress. 
You had no business to do anything of the sort. It's very wrong in a little girl to meddle. You shouldn't have gone into my room in the first place, and you shouldn't have touched a brooch that didn't belong to you in the second. Where did you put it? Oh, I put it back on the bureau. I had it on a minute. Truly, I didn't mean to meddle, Marilla. I didn't think about it being wrong to go in and try on the brooch, but I see now that it was, and I'll never do it again. That's one good thing about me. I never do the same naughty thing twice. You didn't put it back, said Marilla. That brooch isn't anyway on the bureau. You've taken it out of something, Anne. I did put it back, said Anne quickly, pertly, Marilla thought. I don't just remember whether I stuck it on the pincushion or laid it in the china tray, but I'm perfectly certain I put it back. I'll go and have another look, said Marilla, determined to be just. If you put that brooch back, it's still there. If it isn't, I'll know you didn't. That's all. Marilla went to her room and made a thorough search, not only over the bureau, but in every other place she thought the brooch might possibly be. It was not to be found as she returned to the kitchen. And the brooch is gone. By your own admission, you were the last person to handle it. Now what have you done with it? Tell me the truth at once. Did you take it and lose it? No, I didn't, said Anne solemnly, meeting Marilla's angry gaze squarely. I never took the brooch out of your room, and that is the truth. It was to be led to the block for it, although I'm not very certain what a block is. So there, Marilla. Anne's so there was only intended to emphasize her assertion, but Marilla took it as a display of defiance. I believe you're telling me a falsehood, Anne, she said sharply. I know you are. There, now don't say anything more unless you are prepared to tell the whole truth. Yeah, you don't, at least in my mother's household, you don't back talk like that. It's, you gotta be careful. Okay, you gotta be careful out here. Go to your room and stay there until you are ready to confess. Will I take the peas with me? said Anne meekly. No, I'll finish shelling them myself. Do as I bid you. When Anne had gone, Marilla went about her evening tasks in a very disturbed state of mind. She was worried about her valuable brooch. What if Anne had lost it? And how wicked of the child to deny having taken it when anybody could see she must have. With such an innocent face, too. I don't know what I wouldn't sooner have had happen, thought Marilla as she nervously shelled the peas. Of course, I don't suppose she meant to steal it or anything like that. She's just taken it to play with or help along that imagination of hers. She must have taken it, that's clear, for there hasn't been a soul in that room since she was in it, by her own story, until I went up tonight. And the brooch is gone. There's nothing sure. I suppose she has lost and is afraid to own up for fear she'll be punished. It's a dreadful thing to think she tells falsehoods. It's a far worse thing than her fit of temper. It's fearful responsibility to have a child in your house you can't trust. Slyness and untruthfulness, that's what she has displayed. I declare I feel worse about that than the, about the brooch. If she'd only have told the truth about it, I wouldn't mind so much. Marilla went to her room at intervals all through the evening and searched for the brooch without finding it. A bedtime visit to the East Gable produced no result. Anne persisted in denying that she knew anything about the brooch, but Marilla was only the more firmly convinced that she did. She told Matthew the story the next morning. Matthew was confounded and puzzled. He could not so quickly lose faith in Anne, but he had to admit that circumstances were against her. You sure has a fell down behind the bureau was the only suggestion he could offer. I've moved the bureau. And I've taken out the drawers. I've looked at every crack and cranny, was Marilla's positive answer. The brooch is gone, and that child has taken it and lied about it. That's the plain, ugly truth, Matthew Cuthbert. And we might as well look it, look it in the face. Well, now, what are you going to do about it? Matthew asked forlornly, feeling secretly thankful that Marilla not he had to deal with the situation. He felt no desire to put his oar in this time. She'll stay in her room until she confesses, said Marilla, grimly, remembering the success of this method in the former case. Then we'll see. Perhaps we'll be able to find the brooch if she'll only tell where she took it. But in any case, she'll have to be severely punished, Matthew. Well, now you'll have to punish her, said Matthew, reaching for his hat. I've nothing to do with it. Remember, you warned me off yourself. <sighs> Marilla felt deserted by everyone. She could not even go to Mrs. Lynde for advice. She went up to the East Gable with a very serious face and left it with a face more serious still. 
and steadfastly refused to confess. She persisted in asserting that she had not taken the brooch. The child had evidently been crying, and Marilla felt a pang of pity, which she sternly repressed. By night she was, as she expressed it, beat out. You'll stay in this room until you confess, Anne. You can make up your mind to that, she said firmly. But the picnic is tomorrow. Marilla, cried Anne, you won't keep me from going to that, will you? You'll just let me out for the afternoon, won't you? Then I'll stay here as long as you like afterwards, cheerfully. But I must go to the picnic. You'll not go to picnics nor anywhere else until you confess, Anne. Oh, Marilla, gasped Anne. And Marilla had gone out and shut the door. Wednesday morning dawned as bright and fair as if expressly made to order for the picnic. Birds sang around Green Gables. The Madonna lilies in the garden sent out whiffs of perfume that entered in our viewless winds at every door and window and wandered through halls and rooms like spirits of benediction. The birches in the hollow waved joyful hands as if watching for Anne's usual morning greeting from the east gable. But Anne was not at her window. When Marilla took her breakfast up to her, she found the child sitting primly on her bed, pale and resolute, with tight shut lips and gleamy eyes. Marilla, I'm ready to confess. Ah, Marilla laid down her tray. Once again, her method had succeeded, but her success was very bitter to her. Let me hear what you have to say then, Anne. I took the amethyst brooch, said Anne, as if repeating a lesson she had learned. I took it just as you said. I didn't mean to take it when I went in, but it did look so beautiful, Marilla, when I pinned it on my chest, that I was overcome by an irresistible temptation. I imagined how perfectly thrilling it would be to take it to Idlewild and play... I was the Lady Cordelia Fitzgerald. It would be so much easier to imagine I was the Lady Cordelia if I had a real amethyst brooch on. Diana and I made necklaces of roseberries. But what are roseberries compared to amethyst? So I took the brooch. I thought I could put it back before you came home. I went all the way around the road to lift it out the time. When I was going over the bridge across the Lake of Shining Waters, I took the brooch off to have another look at it. How oh, it did look and shine in the sunlight. And then when I was leaning over the bridge, it just slipped through my fingers. So, and went down, 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 all purply, sparkly, and sank forevermore beneath the lake of shining waters. And that's the best I could do at confessing, Marilla. Marilla felt hot anger surge up into her heart again. This child had taken and lost her treasured amethyst brooch, now sat there calmly reciting the details thereof without the least apparent compunction of her or repentance. Anne, this is terrible, she said, trying to speak calmly. You are the very wickedest child I've ever heard of. Yes, I suppose I am, agreed Anne tranquilly. I know I'll have to be punished. It'll be your duty to punish me, Marilla. Will you please get it over with because I like to go to the picnic with nothing on my mind. Picnic indeed! You'll go to no picnic today, Anne Shirley. That shall be your punishment, and it isn't half severe enough either for what you've done. Not go to the picnic? Anne sprang to her feet and clutched Marilla's hand. But you promised me I might. Oh, Marilla, I must go to the picnic. That's why I was... I confessed. Punish me any way you like but that. Oh, Marilla, please, please, please let me go to the picnic. Think of the ice cream. For anything you know, I may never have a chance to taste ice cream again. Marilla disengaged Anne's clinging hand stonily. You needn't plead, Anne. You're not going to the picnic, and that's final. No, not a word. Anne realized that Marilla was not to be moved. She clasped her hands together, gave a piercing shriek, and then flung herself face downwards on the bed, crying and writhing in an utter abandonment of disappointment and despair. For land's sake, gasped Marilla, hastening from the roof. I believe that child is crazy. No child in her senses would behave as she does. If she isn't, she's utterly bad. Oh dear, I'm afraid Rachel was right from the start. But I put my hand to the plow and I won't look back. Oh, 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 careful, careful. Gotta be careful with these sifting cups. There. This was a dismal morning. Marilla worked fiercely and scrubbed the porch floor and the dairy shelves, but she could find nothing else to do. Neither the shelves nor the porch needed it, but Marilla did. Then she went out and raked the yard. 
When dinner was ready, she went to the stairs and called Anne. A tear-stained face appeared looking tragically over the banisters. Come down to your dinner, Anne. I don't want any dinner, Marilla, said Anne sobbingly. You couldn't eat anything. My heart is broken. You'll feel remorse of conscience someday, I expect, for breaking it, Marilla, but I forgive you. Remember when the time comes that I forgive you, but please don't ask me to eat anything, especially boiled pork and greens. Boiled pork and greens are so unromantic when one is in affliction. I love this girl. I love this girl so much. Her her diction and, and her way with words is... It's me, okay? My mother can attest to that. I was that dramatic as a kid when I would be upset. I was very heartfelt with my words. It exasperated, Marilla returned to the kitchen and poured out her tale of woe to Matthew, who between his sense of justice and his unlawful sympathy with Anne was a miserable man. Well, now she shouldn't have taken the brooch, Marilla, or told stories about it, he admitted, mournfully surveying his plateful of unromantic pork and greens as if he, like Anne, thought it a food unsuited to crisis of feeling. But she's such a little thing, such an interesting little thing. Don't you think it's pretty rough not to let her go to the picnic when she's so set on it? Matthew Cuthbert, I'm amazed at you. I think I've let her off, her off entirely too easy. And she doesn't appear to realize how wicked she's been at all, and that's what worries me most. If she'd really felt sorry, it wouldn't be so bad. And you don't seem to realize it neither. You're making excuses for her all the time yourself. I can see that. Well, now, she's just such a little thing, feebly reiterated Matthew. There should be allowances made, Marilla. You know she's never had any bringing up. Well, she's having it now, retorted Marilla. The retorted silence ma silenced Matthew if he had not convinced him. That dinner was a very dismal meal. The only cheerful thing about it was Jer Jerry Bewitt, the hired boy, and Marilla resented his cheerfulness as a personal insult. When her dishes were washed and her bread sponge set and her hands fed, Marilla remembered that she had noticed a small rent in her black lace shawl when she had taken it off on Monday afternoon on returning from the ladies' aid. She would go and mend it. The shawl was in a box in her trunk. As Marilla lifted it out, the sunlight falling through the vines that clustered thickly about the window struck upon something caught in the shawl. Something that glittered and sparkled and fastened some violet light. Marilla snatched it with a gra gasp. It was the amethyst brooch hanging to a thread of the lace by its catch. Dear life and heart, said Marilla blankly. What does this mean? Here's my brooch, safe and sound, that I thought was at the bottom of Barry's pod. Whatever did that girl mean by saying that she took it and lost it? I declare I believe Green Gables is bewitched. I remember now that when I took off my shawl Monday afternoon, I laid it on the bureau for a m minute. I suppose the brooch got caught in this somehow. Well, Marilla betook herself to the east gable, brooch in hand. Anne had cried herself out was sitting dejectedly by the window. Anne Shirley, said Marilla solemnly, I've just found my brooch hanging to my black, black lace shawl. Now I want to know what that rigmarole you told me this morning meant. Why, you said you'd keep me here until I confessed. Oh, poor girl, <laughs> returned Anne wearily. And so I decided to confess because I was bound to get to the picnic. I thought out a confession last night after I went to bed and made it as interesting as could be. And I said it over and over so that I wouldn't forget it. But you wouldn't let me go to the picnic after all, so all my trouble was wasted. Marilla had to laugh in spite of herself, <laughs> but her conscience pricked her. And you do beat all, but I was wrong. I see that now. I should have doubted your word when I had never known you to tell a story. Of course, it wasn't right for you to confess to a thing you hadn't done. It was very wrong to do so, but I drove you to it. So if you'll forgive me, Anne, I'll forgive you and we'll start square again. And now get yourself ready for the picnic. Anne flew up like a rocket. Oh, Marilla, isn't it too late? No, it's only two o'clock. There won't be more than well gathered yet, and it'll be an hour before they have tea. Wash your face and comb your hair and put on your gingham, gingham, uh, gingham dress. I'll fill a basket for you. There's plenty of stuff baked in the house, and I'll get Jerry to hitch up the sorrel and drive you down to the picnic ground. Oh, Marilla, exclaimed Anne, flying to the washstand. Five minutes ago, I was so miserable. I was wishing I had never been born, and now I wouldn't change places with an angel. That night, 
A thoroughly happy, completely tired out Anne returned to Green Gables in a state of beatification impossible to describe. Oh, Marilla, I've had such a perfectly scrumptious time. Scrumptious is a new word I learned today. I heard Mary Alice Bell use it. Isn't it very expressive? Everything was so lovely. We had a splendid tea, and then Mr. Harmon Andrews took us all for a row on the Lake of Shining Waters, six of us at a time. And Jane Andrews nearly fell overboard. <laughs> she was lady out to pick water lilies, and if Mr. Andrews hadn't caught her by her sash just in the nick of time, she should have fallen in and probably been drowned. I wish it had been me. It would have been such a romantic exper experience to have been nearly drowned. It would be such a thrilling tale to tell. And we had the ice cream words failed me to describe that ice cream. Marilla, I assure you, it was sublime. That evening, Marilla told the whole story to Matthew over her stocking basket. I'm willing to own up that I made a mistake, she concluded candidly, but I've learned a lesson. I have to laugh when I think of Anne's confession, although I suppose I shouldn't, for it really was a falsehood, but it doesn't seem as bad as the other would have been somehow. And anyhow, I'm responsible for it. That child isn't hard to understand in some respects, but I believe she'll turn out all right yet. And there's one thing certain. No house will ever be dull that she's in. So, if my mother ever sees this video, I'm going to tell this story. And my, 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 you know this story, okay? So let me break this down real quick. And my cousin Tyra is all here. Hi, sweetie! So when I was, hmm, I think I was nine. This is when I was in Miss Gilliam's class. She was my fourth grade teacher. So this is when I lived in Cleveland Heights. Um, I went to Coventry Elementary. I was a very voracious reader and I was in higher level reading courses. I was reading at a college level in fourth grade. Ooh, excuse me. I had plenty of teachers that like would give me more difficult material when I was growing up. Basically, to make a long story short, thank you, thank you, Era. Um, listen to the story real quick because it's hilarious. Well, it actually kind of gets sad, but it gets funny in the end. Anyway, so there's this book that I actually am going to find to get a copy of. It's called The Frog and the Toad, if I'm not mistaken. It's I think it's a trilogy. Anyway. I read it, loved it. It's kind of a twist on the uh, Frog Prince story. Anyway, it's a very cute novel. I, I had to do a side reading for it in class. And I liked, at the time, to read books in bed. And I had a bedtime. I think my bedtime was like 8.30. So, in the midst of me going to bed, my mom allowed me to read for a certain period of time before it was time for me to go to bed. So I kept the book in the bed with me. I had a bunk bed. So my youngest brother was on the top bunk. I was on the bottom bunk. So, because we had a three bedroom, one bath apartment. It was really nice, y'all. I don't know what the rent was. and My mother can verify this. But it was a really nice apartment. It was very cute, actually. Very spacious from what I can remember. But at one point in time, I think I like turned over and the book fell and my mom heard the crash of the book falling on the floor. It was wood floor. So she assumed that I was up in the middle of the night watching movies or something, um, which my mom, like she had this rule, like if we couldn't sleep, we were allowed to like, you know, watch one of our favorite movies. And then like when we get sleepy, we could go to bed. So when she heard the crash, she thought I was up in the middle of the night watching TV without permission. And I told her I wasn't. I was like, no, Mom, like, I wasn't watching TV. Hi, sweetie. Um, and she was like, no, you telling stories. I know you was up there watching uh, All Dogs Go to Heaven, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. No shade. If you know, you know. If you, if you grew up in the 90s, if you grew up in the late 80s, early 90s, I, I think I knew a lot of kids who had All Dogs Go to Heaven, the first one and the second movie, in their collection on VHS. Love that movie. That movie is, like, tied as favorite movie of all time with me and Beauty and the Beast. Um, so, what ended up happening 
is that I went to school that day and my mom said I was on punishment for disobedience and, you know, being up late at night. So my teacher at the time, um, I had a substitute teacher that day. She was like, well, why don't you write your mom a letter explaining what happened and break it down for her and, you know, apologize again and let her read it. Because one thing I do admire myself upon is that my written word is incredibly poignant. Even when I was a child, I was very well versed when it came to, like, just being expressive through writing. So I wrote my mom a letter explaining what happened. I said, you know, I apologize. Like, the book fell when I turned in bed. And she put two and two together when I dropped the letter off to her when I got home from school. And my mom just read the letter. And maybe like an hour later, she comes back say, I apologize. I apologize for jumping the gun and uh, assuming that you were being disobedient. I apologize. And if memory serves me correctly, we went to um, Panini's, which was this Panini grill spot in downtown Cleveland Heights, which Cleveland Heights is dope. Cleveland Heights to me is the northern urban version of Yellow Springs. That's basically the best way to describe it. Anybody that lives in Yellow Springs knows what I'm talking about. Or anybody that has visited Yellow Springs knows what I'm talking about. Or anybody that's been to Cleveland Heights, shout out to my family in Cleveland, knows what I'm talking about. It's very like bohemian hipster type of deal. Anyway, so that was a, that was a nice treat. You know, I got my own sandwich and got to, you know, hang, like, do what I usually do for the weekend, which is watch my animated shows on Saturday morning, eat a bowl of cereal, stay up and play video games, stuff like that. So, suffice to say, I went through the same situation with that. I just didn't make up a story explaining about something I didn't do. I legitimately was telling the truth. I was like, my, I actually wasn't uh, watching movies without permission. But I love my mom. Because guess what? Parenting does not come with an instruction manual. You do the best of what you know how to do. And you learn as you go along. And I love my mom for showing humility when she is wrong. And I appreciate that. It's okay to own up to when you're wrong. It's okay. So, with that being said, comment below about any time that you've had situations with your parents. And keep it PG, please. Please keep it PG because... That's just my personal rule. I don't curse or do anything like that on my, on my specific pages. Uh, but tell me a story about a time you got in trouble with your parents about something you actually did, did do and then, you know, come to find out you didn't do it and they apologize. So, see y'all later, y'all. Peace, love, and hair grease. Be good out there. I'll see you tomorrow.